Hi, in my last video I talked about how it was just not true that Plato was the only source for the Atlantis legend. And I mentioned how there was another source named Diodorus Siculus who wrote a 40 volume book, maybe around 20 to 30,000 pages, in which he just devotes a few pages to Atlantis. And I show that that shows that there is another independent source for the Atlantis myth. In this dialogue, I'm going to dispel another commonly held myth, which is the belief that that there are only two dialogues in which Plato uh, of Plato in which Atlantis is mentioned or is relevant. That the other dialogues you can completely ignore it when you are trying to um, learn about Atlantis in Plato's dialogues. And I'll show that there are two additional dialogues, at least. I haven't actually read all of them that actually are very much relevant to the Atlantis myth and the themes that it discusses. And, and as you can see, the, the dialogues are named Laws and Phaedo. Now, just to, just to give you a brief overview of the two dialogues that are uh, um, directly, are recognized as the dialogues in which Atlantis is discussed, are Timaeus and Critias. And the, the function of these two dialogues is slightly different. Timaeus really sets the stage for the story. It really tells you what the time and place of the events that happen in the story are. The, the, for example, Atlantis was said to have been destroyed around um, 9,000 years before the time, um, b before their time, which, was, which would be 9600 BC. And Solon was said to have visited Egypt and learned about the story of Atlantis at around 600 BC. And so that's really setting the stage for the time and place. It also explains how the story came to the Greek world and explains that it was originally an Egyptian story that the Greeks brought to the Greek world by happenstance when a famous Greek lawgiver and politician named Solon went to Egypt. And then he heard about the tale from a, from a priest who was there at the time. And the priest later goes on to describe that there is a war between Atlantis and Athens and Egypt on the other side in which Athens was able to defeat this invading Atlantean power despite being vastly outnumbered and that the Athenians themselves have forgotten about this glorious history of the past because of a natural disaster that had destroyed both Atlantis and Athens but had left Egypt spared. And so this really sets the stage for um, a more detailed discussion in the Critias. And here, um, Critias, who has like learned about the story from, from his father and his grandfather, and it's been passed down through the family, he discusses a, a comparative analysis, really, of the ge geography, the customs and traditions, military, political systems, and natural resources of both Atlantis and Athens. This is the part of the Atlantis story that really gives credibility to the idea that Atlantis was real to Atlantis researchers because it goes into an incredible amount of detail and providing numbers and, and measurements, dimensions, the specific type of animals, trees, the, the nature of the minerals, it, it goes into the it goes into such an amount of detail that you think you're reading almost a textbook like a like a basically like an almanac or an encyclopedia or even a Wikipedia article on a country it goes into that level of detail in a very very uh, few number of words very very small number of words it just has this wealth of detail now that's just a brief overview of the Timaeus and the Critias, which are the two dialogues in which Atlantis has been is known to have been discussed. This is kind of like the it's it's something that every Atlantis researcher knows basically. But at this point, many people kind of just stop here and say, "Well, these are the only dialogues in, in of Plato in which Atlantis is discussed." And it's the only dialogue in which Atlantis is used by name. But I argue that the themes and the context in which the Plato, Plato writes these dialogues and presents Atlantis, that the broader themes are also discussed in other dialogues and need to be read and understood in order to really understand the significance of Atlantis 
as presented by Plato. And I'll talk about three broader themes that um, the Atlanta story is touching at and, and show how those other themes are strongly emphasized in at least two other dialogues. And those themes are the concept of deep history, which is the idea that, the, that for example, Egypt and uh, ancient Greece and all these civilizations and human civilizations date back to a far earlier time than, than people have really accepted accepted then in the time of Plato and also even now. The concept of, for example, uh, I'll get to that later, but the second theme is catastrophism. And this is an idea that, that, that the world has been, uh, the world has suffered these great catastrophes and cataclysm disasters that really are on an order of magnitude different from the typical earthquake or flood or even a volcano that really sets back human development to another era and forces us to start again. And that's a theory that has kind of taken on a certain amount of popularity and acceptance in a modern day in which we acknowledge that, for example, asteroid impacts have occurred in the past. And for example, the comet Shoemaker-Levy, which, which impacted Jupiter, we acknowledge that if that had happened to Earth, then we could have had an extinction level event. But catastrophism is still a very controversial idea in modern times. And we'll, I'll get to that later. And the third theme that, that is discussed in Atlantis and is relevant to Atlantis in a broader sense is the theme of heaven or paradise. And with that, I will get into each of the individual themes and a text from two dialogues to, to show that that these themes are present not only in the Atlantis story, but are discussed in a broader sense in Plato's dialogues. The first question that that the Atlantis myth really gets to and is, is relevant to the Atlantis myth is how old is ancient Egypt? How old is ancient Egypt? And in the Timaeus, which is a dialogue in which Atlantis is, is discussed, explicitly using Atlantis by its name, the Egyptian priest says, the important part I will, I will underline here, the Egyptian priest basically says that the constitution that's recorded in the temple in which he is the priest is 8,000 years old. 8,000 years old at that time in which he, this conversation allegedly took place 600 BC, so 8,000 years old would have been 8,600 years BC, or 10,600 years ago. The idea that ancient Egypt had a written language and recorded history on these sacred registers 10,600 years ago is certainly far outside the mainstream Egyptological view. It must have been outside the mainstream at that time too, in the time in which Plato wrote his dialogues. And so that is something that is mentioned in one of the dialogues in which Atlantis is discussed. But the Timaeus and the Critias aren't the only dialogues in which this concept of an ancient Egypt that's even older than, than what is, what is uh, typically believed of their, of their age is mentioned. In the Laws, which is another dialogue that's one of the last ones that he ever wrote, he wrote about this about a conversation about the traditions of Egypt. He said that the, the Athenian stranger says that 10,000 years ago, this is literally true and no exaggeration, their culture has really stayed unchanged and has been preserved over time. And so the idea of an ancient Egypt, an Egypt that's older than that even we believe the Egyptians to be today, knowing everything we know about them, is a concept that is really not just specific to the Atlantis story. If it was just mentioned in the dialogues in which Atlantis was explicitly discussed, you could think of that as kind of like a, a, a literary device that's meant to bring some sort of um, this mysteriousness and this sense of wonder to the Egyptian people and to kind of make them older than they actually are. But, but it's clear that Plato really believes that, Atlant that Egypt was actually 
ten thousand, eight thousand years old in his t- from from his time, and so that really strengthens the belief that that Plato was serious about the Atlantis myth, uh, about the Atlantis story. It wasn't just some isolated dial uh, isolated dialogue in which he was describing this hypothetical civilization. If he did, he was dis- he was really presenting the facts that were that were mentioned in that dialogue in other dialogues so he was really he had this belief and this this conviction that ancient egypt was 10,000 years old and so another really important theme that's that's mentioned in plato's dialogues is the concept of catastrophism and in the Timaeus, which is one of the dialogues in which Atlantis is mentioned explicitly by name, it is said that there are these deluges and these floods that every, every once in a while happen and cause the people who are living in the lower lying lands to just be, um, to just suffer complete destruction. But the survivors are left on the high mountains. And that every time human civilization starts back up again, the flood hap comes again and then restarts, then resets that entire process. And so this is mentioned in the in a specific myth in which Atlant a specific dialogue in which Atlantis is discussed. And in the laws in which in which scholars do not acknowledge that this has any relevance to Atlantis, there's a conversation in, in another dialogue in which in which clearly um, the Athenian people of the time they this this kind of conversation that took place in the Timaeus is almost comp- almost like it's not word for word, but it's a basic paraphrase of the general concept that that there have been destructions of mankind occasioned by deluges and other other um, idea uh, other disasters, and that the hill shepherds and the farmers who who were living in the top of the mountains would have been the survivors and so this concept this conversation with the egyptian priest is is not just the the ideas that that are discussed in that conversation with the egyptian priest in the timaeus are not just isolated to that that dialogue but are present in other dialogues so it forms a really essential part of plato's overall worldview which contradicts the idea that plato just made up atlantis to illustrate a point because because um it's clearly a core aspect of his worldview and if he's going to make up a story that's so central that, that has themes that are so central to his essential worldview, then his whole credibility as a philosopher is just called into question. And I think we have enough respect for Plato as a philosopher to suggest that if he believed, if the ideas that he talked about in, in the dialogue of Atlantis are present in other dialogues, they they increase the probability that that these themes of catastrophism and an ancient Egypt that was older than is currently accepted were coherent, were formed a part of a coherent worldview that was essential to his entire um, philosophical doctrine rather than just a particular story of Atlantis that was made up and, and being ice with the, the idea of Atlantis being completely isolated from his general philosophical worldview. And so another important concept that um, Plato discusses in his dialogues is the concept of heaven or paradise. And it is commonly believed that Atlantis, when people think of Atlantis, they think of this heavenly paradise. In the, in the, and while while Plato never really explicitly uses that word heaven or paradise, it's really evident from the fact that the description of Atlantis that he provides that that Atlantis is as close to a heaven or an earthly paradise as you could possibly get. Look at look at how he described it in the Critias, which is a book in which, which is a dialogue in which Atlantis is explicitly discussed. With such blessings, the earth freely furnished them. In wondrous and infinite abundance, the sacred island. That sounds like a paradise to me. I don't know about you. And also, he talked about the groves of Poseidon, which were of wonderful height and beauty, the excellence of the soil, wealth that was 
never possessed in it by kings before and is not likely to ever be again. And they dug out these vast quantities of minerals that they used to build these this giant temple that was just covered in silver and gold and all of these precious metals. And the concept of a civilization of this amount, this degree of material and agricultural and natural wealth is really not just an isolated concept that's only discussed in the two dialogues in which Plato is explicitly talking about Atlantis. But in another dialogue of Plato that has traditionally not been regarded as one that is relevant to the Atlantis myth, Phaedo, Socrates says the following, And in this fair earth, the things that grow, the trees and the flowers and fruits are correspondingly beautiful, and so too the mountains and the stones are smoother and more transparent and more lovely in color than ours. And the earth there is adorned with all the jewels and with the gold and silver and everything of the sort. For they are so they are in plain sight abundant and large and in many places, so that the earth is a sight to make those blessed who look upon it. And Socrates is talking about the idea that in general there are these places on the earth that are special, where everything is more beautiful, where everything there's a more greater abundance of, of precious metals and trees and flowers and fruits, and everything is just amazing there. And that, that concept really ties back to the Atlantis myth as presented in Critias, in Critias. And so the idea that this paradise is, is just an isolated concept, that the concept of Atlantis as this paradise is only really self-contained within the myths, within the dialogues in which Atlantis is explicitly named, is false. Clearly, Socrates and Plato believed that these paradises actually existed, right? This wasn't just some story that they had created, a story about this fictional paradise. This was a coherent and a self-consistent worldview that the authors of the dialogues, that Plato and Socrates and that entire philosophical community, which may have been a small circle, but they still nevertheless believed in the concept of these special worlds and these heavens and these paradises. And so I believe that these three themes really illustrate a major point that, <clears throat> that Atlantis may not have been just some, some minor um, side note to Plato's worldview, but that it may have been a central part of Plato's worldview that is not only discussed in the two dialogues that are traditionally attributed to the Atlantis myth, but, but, but these two other dialogues too, uh, which are named Phaedo and Laws. And I haven't read all of the other dialogues yet in, in that much detail, so maybe there's, there's going to be other references to these concepts that are discussed in Plato's dialogues. And so I'll end with this. The big picture is, what if the portrayal of Socrates as being primarily concerned with moral and ethical issues rather than the natural world what if that's a distortion of the facts and Socrates was actually concerned with both equally? For example, in the previous passage, Socrates seems to be making a claim about these special areas of the world that are better and more beautiful and more blessed with resources than, than the regular parts, the, the parts that we are familiar with. And that doesn't seem to be really an ethical or moral issue, but it seems to concern itself with the natural world. And so how many other passages of, Socrates, of Plato's dialogues have just been completely ignored because, because the moral and the ethical issues have just taken up all the attention and all the focus? What if, what if Socrates is actually saying a lot more than we think he's saying? And what if Atlantis is not just incidental to Plato's dialogues and worldview, but is one of the, if not the central element. That is, what if, what if our perception of Atlantis as being just a side, a side note or an auxiliary to his overall philosophical doctrine, what if that's false? And what if Atlantis is the single most important part of Plato's philosophical dialogue, the philosophical framework? And with that, I will end this presentation.